Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show where we look at the new economic initiatives of the Rich Countries Club of the G7. This weekend in the unlikely and idyllic setting of Carbis Bay in Cornwall, the G7 leaders will ratify an agreement for minimum corporate tax rates to impact on transnational companies. Is this a welcome breakthrough against the tech giant's tax avoidance positioning or a carve up to ensure the rich get richer or perhaps it's a bit of both? In advance of the summit, we talked to two political economists who know the answers. Former Member of Parliament for East Lothian, George Kerevan, and the UK taxation specialist, Professor Richard Murphy. This key interview coming up soon, but first, to tweets, emails and messages in response to our show last week, featuring Jim Shannon MP and Lord Dafford Wigley. John Fisher says, good discussion, and I'm of a mind to welcome any plan aiming for a Celtic bloc among nations leaving this UK. It's not the same and it's not supposed to be. Mo Bowman says, I've called it the disunited kingdom for a very long time. Dave Macbeth says, give Ireland back to the Irish. Let the DUP argue their case in a united Ireland. Bob Howey says, we need an English independence party. And finally, Billy Holland says, the Ulsterisation of my nation ends with independence. Tick tock, the empire's on a clock. Now, not since the hero of the hit TV series, Ross Poldark, was busy outwitting the excisemen across its rugged coastline, has taxation and Cornwall gone so well together. Because despite the claim that the jewel of Cornwall, St Ives, was chosen as this weekend's G7 location because it exemplifies clean and green issues, it is the murky world of the filthy lucre which has dominated the summit run-up. A minimum corporate tax of 15% with a nudge towards the long campaign for online transaction tax has been proposed and agreed by the finance ministers. However, is this a giant step forward as claimed by Chancellor Rishi Sunak or an elementary step over for the corporate giants as suggested by Oxfam? In short, will the accommodation between big tech and big governments make the weak stronger or just the strong richer? To discuss, over to Alex, George Kerevan and Professor Richard Murphy. Professor Richard Murphy, the, the Treasury says that Chancellor Rishi Sunak has rallied the finance ministers to take money off the, the big corporates and presumably give it to the, the world's poor. What's not to like about that? Well, let's be clear. We've had an extraordinary and historic agreement announced. It's only announced. This is not signed up. This is not finalised. There's a long way to go. And there are good dimensions to this. I like the fact that there's a minimum tax rate agreed, but I'm already hearing that people are arguing that 15% should now be the world minimum tax rate. No, it is the floor below which you don't go. This is aimed at the world's largest corporations. They have been seeing their tax rate cut for years and have been exploiting the world's tax havens to make sure they pay even less than they were being asked to do. So look, there's good stuff in here, but there's bad stuff in here too. First of all, that 15% minimum tax rate is far too low. The average OECD tax rate is 25%. So why did they agree something so far below the average OECD tax rate, below the UK tax rate? And this deal with regard to the reallocation of profits to developing countries is tiny. I've looked at the accounts of Barclays. Just as an example, they make a 14% tax rate, a, ta a profit margin. Only 0.8% of their profits will be reallocated towards the countries where their customers are, and the amount of tax that might be involved is less than 30 million. Let's not get too excited about the fact that this is going to solve the world's problems. That part of it won't. The minimum tax rate could, but only if it was more than 15%. So a deal, a breakthrough deal, but one which has yet to meet expectations. The G20 should improve this enormously on the way, is my suggestion. Well, George Caravan, a qualified welcome from uh, Richard Murphy. Does, does that fit your estimation, or are you even more sceptical? I'm afraid, Alex, I have to admit to be a bit more sceptical. I think we're having the wool pulled over our eyes by Biden and, uh, and his cronies. Um, the OECD, the big, the big Western industrial nations, um, uh, think tank has been trying to broker a tax deal for years and hasn't managed to get agreement. So I think what we're seeing with the G7, which is a smaller group of nations, is Biden trying to round up support so he can go next month to Venice 
we're all meeting G20 and try and get one over on the Chinese and the Brazilians and the Indians. And we've yet to see whether that will work. And actually, if you look at the small print uh, of the G7 agreement, lots of loopholes, lots of things still to be decided. Above all, who gets taxed? Uh, there's a debate about which companies, and supposedly it's big companies, but what counts as big? Uh, what they're talking about is companies that earn a profit rate of over 10%. Does that include Amazon? No, Amazon comes in about 6 7% because of the way they, they fickle, fiddle, fickle the books. So I think, I think there's a long way to go on this. Uh, it's a game, it's a dance between the big uh, exporting nations as to who can get control. Richard Murphy, from your taxation specialist perspective, the, the point that George Kerrigan makes about Amazon and their, their level of profit, is that why Oxfam was saying, look, this is going to be an easy step over for the many of the big multinationals? It is for Amazon. I mean, we have to put Amazon in a box by itself with regard to this. All the other tech companies, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Microsofts, and so on, are all going to be caught by this. They are making more than 10% profit rates. Amazon is fundamentally a retailer with regard to a great deal of its activity and has one other division which supplies web services to other companies, which is highly profitable, overall making six or seven percent. It would be very difficult to find a deal that did not bring in most of the world's companies into this arrangement without, uh, if you wanted to keep Amazon in it. I mean, literally, you'd have to extend it to virtually everyone. Quite clearly, that was not going to win support in the G7, and I doubt it was going to win support in the G20. So there's a compromise being made. Amazon will fall out of this deal. It does not make much money compared to the other companies in proportion to turnover, so it is going to get away with this. But it is not a pure tech company like the rest. What is surprising about this deal is how many companies have been drawn into it. So, for example, Rishi Sunak has now realised that he signed a deal which brings very large parts of the City of London inside this arrangement, which I don't think he understood last Saturday, and he's now trying to backtrack on. I mean, how fast can this government turn do a U-turn on a deal that's already agreed? At this rate, it's a few days. They're literally already saying, can we have a carve-out to take the UK out of this deal, having only agreed it last weekend? So there are, and I would entirely agree with George, some really big issues here. I I just don't think Amazon is the stumbling block that should stop us doing the best we can. Can I also agree with George on something? There's a lot of negotiation to go here. Now, I know that negotiation process. I have spent far too many hours in the basement of the OECD in Paris, where the negotiating tables literally are. They are underground, under a chateau um, in the outskirts of Paris. And I was heavily involved in the last round, 2013 to 2015, and literally in the room. And there will be those rooms again. Who knows? I might end up back there. The point is that actually the devil is in the detail. And in this case, the devil is going to be around the accounting. What is a profit margin? What is turnover? Large companies, high tax figures in three statements in their accounts, not just one. And most people seem to think it's only in the income statement, but it isn't. All of these technical things need to be taken into account. Very few people have actually discussed that as yet. I put up a whole series of questions, which a lot of journalists have looked at on my blog, saying, look, there really is a nightmare in terms of negotiation to go here, and there will be a lot of game playing to come. These companies are great at game playing. Oh, there's one group you can guarantee who are going to be opposing this, and that's the big four firms of accountants, because this deal is bad news for the tax havens who charge 0% tax which have been used very heavily by the tech companies and which are serviced by those big four firms of accountants, they are going to find their businesses threatened by this, which is what the intention is, after all. That really is the aim. And so they're going to fight hard. Well, they fought hard in 2013 to 15 against something called country by country reporting, which I created, which is now the law and which is the basis of a lot of this deal. And they're going to fight hard this time, too. So yeah, we are nowhere near a final deal yet. But I think we could get a deliverable deal. I'm more optimistic than George. But that 15 percent tax rate is way too low. Well, George Caravan, uh, Richard Murphy says alarm bells ringing in the big four accountancy companies. But some of the big corporates have made quite favourable responses to this putative deal. I mean, Nick Clegg was effusive in a statement. Does that send your alarm bells ringing? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, Nick Clegg was 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 hired to be to be a frontman to uh, to smooth away uh, the rough edges. So let's not pay too much attention to him. The big high tech companies, the, the big American ones, uh, like Google, um, they are um, uh, 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 Microsoft. They are they make a fortune. And they've kept that money to themselves. In fact, they've got so much cash built up over the last decade um, that they simply cannot, um, they're having to give it back to their shareholders, they're having to buy back their shares, because uh, they can't, they have too much to even bother investing because uh, there aren't the outlets. Um, and so they're going to buy a little, a little, um, uh, a little, you know, public relations with this. Um, I'm intrigued by the fact, uh, as Richard was saying, about what happens to the big banks, the investment banks, um, the, the hedge funds uh, who operate internationally. Are they going to be taxed? Now, most of the discourse has been about, about the, the exporting companies, about, about your, your, your Amazons, your Microsofts. Um, uh, I, I could see the deal ending up the, the, the big financial companies escape the taxation. Uh, I think that will be the major fault line uh, in the debates over the next year. I mean, the Americans have always been very canny about keeping their, their financial sector out of any international agreements. Uh, so we could see we could see see that that coming, uh, and that that would be my bottom line. But again, just look at the small print, as Richard was saying. Um, uh, where does this new tax fall? It's not 15% on everything. Um, it's, companies to be taxed are those earning a profit rate of 10% and above, and they get to keep the 10%. It's a, it, the tax comes on everything above the 10%, and even only on a fifth of that. So when you work out how much extra tax there's going to be, well, there's an OECD estimate I've seen, which is 50 to 80 billion globally from all the companies. Now, 50 to 80 billion dollars globally is, frankly, in terms of the international economy, peanuts. So don't expect a lot of money is going to end up in the National Health Service. Right, Richard uh, Murphy, in a word, progress, or should we read the fine print? Oh, re read the fine print, but we could make progress if we negotiate well. Join us after the break when Alex continues his conversation with George Kerevan and Richard Murphy. We'll see you then. Welcome back. Alex is in conversation with George Kerevan and Professor Richard Murphy. Now, Professor Richard Murphy, what do you make of this, uh, these remarks by US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who, who seems to be advocating a a Keynesian expansionist course for the world economy and telling the G7 to lead the way. I, I believe that that is what she thinks. I think Janet Yellen is leading us in a Keynesian expansion. It's very clear that Biden is breaking all the rules. He does not think the debt needs to be repaid in the USA. And he and she are communicating to the world, open your coffers, spend when you can. You have what is called fiscal headroom. That means there is literally the capacity in very many countries, Germany in particular, but the UK still has plenty of fiscal capacity to spend more, get people to work, prevent unemployment, get the economy investing in the things we need, like the Green New Deal. Yeah, I think they really want to do that. That's their plan. George Kevin, this should be music to your radical ears. I mean, sleepy Joe Biden's not so sleepy after all. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely true. I mean, we are, we are on the cusp of, of, of a major economic change. Um, since 2007, 8, the, 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 the banking crisis, the world's entered a deflationary period. Uh, there used to be a thing called inflation, disappeared. Uh, and and that, that essentially means it's, it, it, it's difficult for firms to make profits because firms make their best profits when you get when you get inflation. They keep bumping the price. Uh, uh, plus, there are whole new um, um, political challenges, and clearly, America is facing down China. So the American state wants to spend more money, as as uh, as we've heard, there's a little there's some some headroom there. Um, I'm a little bit cautious in the sense that. Um, COVID has disrupted lots of supply change, chains. It might take uh, you know, more than a year, maybe five years, maybe the decade to get things sorted out. So that there are pockets of shortages which are causing um, inflation here and there. Um, but by and large, I think Biden and the Americans decided they have, to, they have to outspend China and put America back on top. And that's what's happening. It's politics here, not just economics. 
Richard Murphy, is that at the heart of this? I mean, behind the economics, is this the American administration saying, look, the uh, rich man's club, the G7, the Western economies, it's time to lead the way. And since there's nobody attractive leading the, the world into permanent recession, we better lead the world into a sustained recovery. Is that what's behind this? Well, I pick out one of the words you used there, Alex, which was sustained, only I think it might be a sustainable recovery. I mean, it's very bizarre to have Biden, the man that we didn't expect to be a radical, being so radical. And maybe that's because he expects to only be a single term president. So he's just going to throw everything against the wall in this first term. And he's going to make the changes he wants straight away. And I believe that what this is about. China is a factor in this, but it's not the only one. I mean, they are really trying to beat the Republicans. And the Republicans have got a very hard core of support, as we can see, which is still around Trump. And so they've got to convince middle and working class America that there is a future for them because they have lost out very badly in recent decades. There is a crisis in middle uh, class incomes. Now, this policy invest, spend, do sustainability, rebuild the infrastructure of America is a domestic policy as well as an in international policy. But I think he's also hearing his radical Democrats standing on the sidelines saying to him, Green New Deal, Green New Deal, Joe, uh, Joe, deliver us what we want. And add all those together and you come out with this, well, mix, which is a pure Keynesian inflationary policy in the sense of inflating the economy. I don't think it will deliver long-term inflation, by the way. I agree with George that I think that there is a short-term risk, but not a long-term one. Wages are not going to rise that radically. So he's put together a very clever package here. So, so George Caravan, how much intellectual thinking in terms of the economics is behind this. I mean, is this a, a response to the world crisis, the world pandemic, uh, a grim future without uh, radical action, or, or is this a kind of combination of new militarism, new Keynesian, that actually is an intellectual base for saying a lot of people have been far, far too worried about uh, fiscal deficits for far too long? Well, I think, I think a lot of it is pragmatic rather than theoretical. But I think there's a, a, a dawning realization uh, in the United States and, and, and here in the UK um, that uh, governments can print money, uh, at least in the short term, at least if there's a, a, a crisis of demand, uh, and get away with it. And so what we've seen, what we're seeing in America, what we're seeing here, um, is that the, the, the kind of restrictive fiscal policies uh, that dominated uh, conservative thinking, small c, uh, for the last 10, 20 years, have just gone out the window. They've said that the printing press has been churning out dollars and, and, and pounds, and the roof hasn't fallen in. And I think the politicians are being to realize, well, OK, let's let's make hay uh, while we can. Uh, we, we can spend some money and buy ourselves some support and solve some of our problems. Uh, now, where all this ends up, I think, uh, could be with a headache. Um, I, I, I don't think you can run an economy simply by printing money, uh, but I think for the for the next electoral cycle, we're clearly going to see this dominate. And I think, as usual, um, uh, the, the, the economists will try and pick up the pieces by the mid-decade. Richard Murphy, both yourself and George Kervin, you as a, 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 an observer and commentator, George as a practitioner, of course, as a former member of parliament, uh, have been involved in the Scottish constitutional debate that's what we're talking about, have a dramatic effect on one debate, which is whether Scotland should have a, a central bank and have one as quickly as possible once it's independent. We're remembering the world who can print money, taking economic opportunities. Does that have a direct impact on that debate? Yes, it does. Very clearly it does. Because if Scotland is independent, it too will want a part of this investment programme. It too will want to deliver a Green New Deal. And to do that, it has to have the ability to print money. Now, I'd rather use the word create than print because all of this stuff is electronic, of course, and it's done through quantitative easing. Scotland also needs control over its tax system, which isn't possible without control over the central bank and money. I think the three are fundamentally and intimately linked to control the impacts of that money creation, particularly the impact upon inequality, which is the one that worries me most about this, because a lot of the money that is created ends up in the hands of the richest in society. Now, Scotland, therefore, needs to have an integrated macroeconomic policy 
policy to handle this and to deliver the growth that people in Scotland will expect after independence. In fact, that's why they want independence. So these things all hang together in a Scottish scenario, which demands that there really will have to be a very short transition from sterling to a Scottish pound or whatever it is called. George Kelvin, now you've got an overwhelming urge to, to scream at some of your former detractors, look at what's happening in world economics and apply it to the Scottish situation. Uh, absolutely, indeed. I mean, if, if we had been independent from the referendum in, in, in 2014 and we kept the pound sterling, at this moment, the Scottish government would be up the creek. It wouldn't be able to um, create money, as Richard says, so it wouldn't have been able to cover the, can the pandemic crisis and the funding of that. It would have had to go cap in hand to the City of London to try and borrow at usurious in interest rates. I mean, the whole thing would have been a debacle. You can't have independence and have somebody else run your currency and your economic policy and your monetary policy. You know, independence means monetary independence. That should be ABC. And if we haven't got that clear by now, uh, I don't know when, when we ever will do. It wasn't that Keynes himself who said, when the facts change, then I changed my mind with the facts. He did indeed. He did it. He was a, he was a, a rare pra pragmatist at keeping his his class and his system going. Uh, I have to. I think we have to, to learn the lesson and keep keep Scotland going and, and operating Scotland's interest rather than the banker's interest. But the, the lastly, two two radical economists, as I've termed you. Let, let's look at the distribution across the planet. The G7 may be leading the way in a an expansionary direction, maybe starting to tax those who needed tax. How much are the world's poor going to see of these returns? I mean, you referred earlier, Richard Murphy, to the percentage that might go to, to helping the, those on their uppers is tiny. Uh, is that an underlying concern you have in terms of this, this what looks like promising economic initiatives? Look, this is a fundamental concern. And it's actually a change of emphasis within the G8, G7. I was at the 2013 summit chaired by David Cameron. Remember him? Well, he chaired it and he actually had an announcement on tax in Loch Earn in Northern Ireland then, which focused upon the fact that the rewards of tax reform should go to developing countries. The reality is that this deal is not going to do that, not by a long way. And I, I've mentioned already, I spent time at the OECD during that period, and I can remember talking to the Chinese and to the Indian, Indians who were saying, we want our share. And there's a very aggressive tax authority in South Africa that's also going to be leading the African charge on this, I suspect. And they're very good. Now, I, they're going to be in the debating chamber. They're not going to be left outside when it comes down to doing the detail. So I really do not expect the deal that we're seeing at present as being the one that will end up with its horrible bias towards head office countries like the UK, like the USA, like Germany. And we have to see a fairer outcome. I don't believe they'll buy it unless that changes. Josh Cameron, how are we going to avoid those who've been in the, the hint end, as we say in Scotland, of world economics for so long, having the, the same treatment as we move into a new environmentally sustainable world, <laughs> they take the costs of that change uh, and see very few of the benefits. How can we avoid such a, a maldistribution of world resources continuing? Well, there, there are about 140 countries um, currently in negotiation through OECD on a global tax deal. Uh, and ultimately, they all have to be brought within the tent. So I think, I think they should use uh, uh, this moment uh, to say to the G7, OK, that's your opening off offer, but we want more. Certainly the 15% tax rate needs to rise and so forth. So I, th I think we need, we need a bit, of, a bit of, of international negotiation. And I think the, 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 the poorer nations, um, particularly some, some of the developing nations like Brazil, have to be prepared to say no deal unless what we get what we want. And for the UK, the UK has already, remember, passed a tax, a new tax on digital companies and it's held that in abeyance after uh, Donald Trump growled at Boris. I think the UK right away should implement its digital tax, cream off the money, and we could use that, for instance, to, to get our, our percentage payment uh, uh, for international aid up to back to where it should be. George Kervin, Professor Richard Murphy, thank you so much for joining me again on the Alex Salmon Show. Thanks, Alex. Thank you.
Chancellor Rishi Sunak is keen to stress that it was he who personally rallied the G7 finance ministers to pursue the 15% corporate tax deal. Indeed, the UK Treasury press release talks about it being time for the tech giants to pay their fair share. However, two other statements should give pause for thought before the Chancellor is inaugurated as Cornwall's answer to Robin Hood. First, as international charities have pointed out, the 15% minimum represents a very low bar and some 10% less than the level originally mooted by American President Joe Biden. Second, and even more interestingly, the tech giants themselves have welcomed the initiative. Now, sometimes when turkeys apparently vote for Christmas, it is as well to check whether they are really turkeys and whether it's really Christmas. More significantly, this looks like a shift to the consumer power of the big battalions. It is clear that the big economies are looking for ways to refill their treasury coffers in the post-COVID world. A shift in resource from big corporates to big governments. What is less clear is whether any of this redistribution will find its way to the countries which are genuinely on their uppers. Indeed, the simultaneous controversy over the UK government's cut in its aid budget rather sullied their attempts to present themselves as any friend or ally of the world's poor. But for now, from Alex, myself and all at the show, stay safe and we hope to see you all again next week.